Hi, my name is Whitney Herbst and I'm going to be talking to you about base. What we're going to start off with is how do you get this thing out of the case? So what we're going to start with is we're going to get the bow out. The reason why we start with the bow is because we don't want the bow to get damaged while we're getting the larger part of the instrument out. Once that is done, set the bow aside. Now, the first step is to lay the base over. I have a latch, so I'm gonna release the latch. Now you notice that I put the base down with the long zipper up top. That's gonna to be important because you have to unzip it. After this step, for me, I like to lift the base back up. I find it to be easier on my back. Also, it's easier for children as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lift from the base. So I'm gonna go on this side because that's where my long zipper is. I'm gonna tighten up the case around the base again, and I'm gonna grab the base from the underneath. And I'm gonna lift up, spin the base around, and I'm gonna put my body into the case to help open it up. So if I turn this way, I'm going back behind the base, and then what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna lift around to get it around the quiver and the bridge, grab the base neck, and then I'm gonna lean and lift it over. Now, the same applies if I'm gonna put it back in the case, right? I pick up the case, I stick my body inside, I get my leg, I go over, I lift up, come around, I tighten the case, I zip it, <laughs> tighten this up again, and then proceed to put my bow into the bow holder. And that's it. The next section we're gonna talk about is instrument setup. Now, to determine if a base is good or bad, there are a few things we look for. Here, I've named the section the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, the reason why I add and the ugly is because a lot of bases don't look very good. Um, they have a lot of scars, especially school bases, they've been through a lot. And so to determine if a base is good or bad, these are the things you're gonna be looking for. Now, if we're gonna start with the good, we're gonna want low strings. Now, to determine if a base has low strings, you can see mine, mine are very low, right? A lot of times, if you can get your fingers underneath these strings, up here, then the action's gonna be too high. Now the next part will be the bow. You want full bow hair. Now this one has been through some abuse this year and you can see how it's starting to lose hair on the edges, right? So this one's gonna need a rehair and you're gonna see that's dirty down here. For a bow, That's in better condition, it has full bow hair, right? And it's not very dirty. The next thing you're gonna look for is the bridge. Now, you wanna make sure that they're spaced evenly apart, right? The next thing you're gonna check for is the bridge. The bridge needs to be at the same angle as your fingerboard. Now, The last and most important part is the end pin. This is vital. If the end pin does not work, the student cannot play the bass correctly. So you need to make sure that the screw is easy to do, easy to tighten, easy to loosen, and that the end pin can come out all the way. For bad bases, we're gonna start down at the bottom, since the base is already down on the floor, broken end pins, the screw won't loosen, it won't 
come undone, the end pin won't come out. Some people like to go after it with pliers. Don't do that because you end up having to replace this whole mechanism. Just take it to a luthier and they'd be able to loosen it for you. The next spot going up from the bottom is dead strings. To know if your strings are dead, I'm gonna try and recreate this. You would play a note. See, my strings aren't dead, so the note stays at that pitch, right? If the strings are dead, what it's gonna do is slightly go flat, right? So each time, that's what you hear when you engage the note. Now, if we're moving up, bad bridge. This would include if the bridge is warped, either going this way or going this way. Also, if the bridge doesn't have the correct shape or the correct spacing down here. The reason why that's important is because as string players, we have to have enough space to clear the string. So if it's not spaced correctly or doesn't have the right angle on the bridge, you end up getting double stops. And then again, we talked about bow hair. This poor bow needs to be rehaired. Um, sometimes I've seen some little bows that have just had a couple little slivers on it. So at that point, you know, either buy a new one, get it rehaired. Um, Lastly, we talked about the high strings. Again, for somebody that's starting out, to be able to engage those strings all the way down puts a lot of pressure on your hands and on your tendons. So this is to ensure that students can have good posture and good physical health. Thanks. The next section we're gonna talk about is quick tips for a busy teacher. These are just all good things to keep in mind if you're teaching string bass or in an orchestra. Now, you can put a little bit of graphite from a pencil underneath your string so you loosen one string at a time and you rub the lead of the pencil on the bridge. What that does is it creates a little bit of a slip down here. You can also do that at the nut as well. Now this is something I've seen, which I think is very bad. They, some students will put their bow, see how careful I am trying to do this. They'll put their bow inside of the F hole. The reason why this is dangerous is for one, basses trying to get in and out of a door is just dangerous in general. Um, but if you have your bow and you're carrying your bass, this can get caught. It can crack the F hole down here. It could break the bow. It can cause damage uh, to the sound post as well. So this is something I definitely do not recommend. If you have students that have trouble carrying their bow, what they can do is you, I hook it into my middle finger. <clears throat> Sometimes you could do the pinky as well to be able to hold the bow and carry the bass, or what you can do is assign buddies. So what I've done in the past is you get a violin buddy, they carry your music and they carry your bow and they help you open the door as well. And so the bass player, all they have to do is worry about the bigger part of the instrument. Now this one is also very important. I make sure to do this, educate your parents. Um, if you have a parent that drives a truck, you don't want them carrying the base in the back of the truck in the middle of summer. It's 100 degrees, correct? It gets very hot. Also, how to load the base in and out of the car. This would also include how to take care of the base within the home as well. Now, the end pin, every time you go to set it down or carry the base, you want to make sure the end pin is lowered. So, since I'm not playing, my end pin's not out. I'm going to bring my end pin out. Now say that I was going to carry the base and my end pin is out. If I hit something, I can hurt the mechanism down below or break it. 
And then again, the reason why you want to lower it while you're not playing is if somebody walks past your base and hits your in pin, it could knock the base over. And again, out of habit, lowering my end pin. Also, another important one is personal space. You want to make sure that your bass players have enough space to play. I can't tell you how many times I've been stabbed because our bases are down low. So we're either stabbing the person next to us or the person behind us, right? So again, this is all very important for bass care. Now, when I go to set down my base, if I can find a wall, I'll set down my base, bridge in. So we're always protecting the bridge. And then what I do with my bow is I set it down and we'll go over this again. I'll turn it around so you can see it. I set the bow frog right here and the hair resting against the bridge. Now during long breaks, you want to make sure that the bass goes into the case so you can make sure that nothing really happens to it, the case is padded, that's what it's here to do is to protect the instrument. Another important one is music ed etiquette. You want to make sure that your kids are being nice to each other, supporting each other, sharing information. Basses can kind of be a lonely instrument, so you want to make sure that all your kids are getting along. Last but not least, if you're going to put tapes on your fingerboard, you want to make sure that you replace them often. The tapes do slide around, so you want to make sure that they are in the correct place for the student. And that covers our section. Let's move to the next section. I call this my favorite things. This is everything that I have in my base case. So to start, this first list is stuff that every base player should have in their case. First is a rock stop. Bass rock stops have the big circle. Cello rock stops have the small circle. Why are these important? If a bass doesn't have a stopper at the end, you cannot recommend a student play on tile or wood because the bass could slip out from underneath them and go crashing on the floor. So again, rock stop is vital. Next is a soft cloth. I have a washcloth. It helps get the rosin off a little easier. You've seen mine has had some love over the years. Next is Pops Rosin. Why is Pops important? It is sticky and it, it makes sure that the bow actually engages with the strings. Um, other rosin just isn't really sticky enough to do the job. When do you know when Pops has gone bad? When the Pops has lost its shine, then you need to replace it. And you see in this one, I kind of explain it like Jurassic Park, the paper kind of gets sucked up into the rosin because it's melted so many times. That's not really hurting the rosin. Um, this one is starting to go bad. It just depends on what batch you get. But you see here, it's just not as shiny as it is down in here. Moving on, a tuner slash metronome. Basses should always tune before they play. They are very easily knocked out of tune by how hot the room is or cold the room is. Um, I recommend the Korg. It's very easy to use. With the cord, I have students get a matrix clip. I know quite a few teachers that use this in their classrooms. They just have one back there for their bass players and they can tune very quickly. They stick this on the bottom of the bridge and they can tune without the other instruments affecting them. So where it would actually clip into would be right down here right in the center. I recommend the matrix it, because it's flat. A lot of times um, clip-on tuners that are rounded don't pick up the low frequencies as well. Just like that. Most important part, a pencil. I always have my students do the pencil check to make sure that they can 
mark in anything that they need in their music. Now, these are kind of the additional things. I always have kind of a copper sponge. The Pops rosin gets very stubborn to remove off the strings. Again, we're in a very hot climate. So what it does is it adheres to the strings down here. So what I do is I rub the copper sponge up and down and that removes the rosin quickly. Now, a lot of people ask me, where do I get this copper sponge? I get it from the kitchen aisle. Do not get steel wool, it will damage the strings. Don't have the other string players like cellists, violists, violinists use this because it could damage their strings. Next is a dampen. This helps prevent cracks in the base, also, you know, seams opening. And this goes in to the F hole after you're done playing, down like this. Now, if you start using a dampen, you have to keep using it or else, you know, having the wood fluctuate can actually cause more harm than good. Next, you saw me sitting on it, is a stool. Um, I use drum thrones. Uh, wooden stools work as well. You just have to decide what the height is that you want. Um, again, for stool, this one has a three prong. You want to make sure that you always have a leg and back. So that you do not want to sit with two legs even because the stool can tip over very easily. Now this is the one I always get questions about, is my little toothbrush. Um, for the toothbrush, where's my bogo? There it is. This helps with the pops on your hair. Now this one's, again, it's in pretty good shape. Um, in the summer, if I'm traveling with my bow, I'm going to notice that my bow hair is going to stick together. So what I would do is I loosen it up just a little bit and I run it through the bow hair and that breaks up that pops rosin. It helps with the tone and it also gives you the capability to apply new rosin. Talking about hot weather in Bakersfield, I have a bow case I recommend it to all of my students, especially students that do have to transport their base in a truck. The case or the bow is actually the one that gets affected the most. So with the bow case, you can transport your bow where it's cooler in the car if you have to transport it that way. For me, I always put my bow in last. So that helps with my pops not melting all over my bow. Next on the list is a quiver. This is this little mechanism down here. This is great. We've talked about how to hold your bow if you're carrying it. This just makes it so much easier. The bow just goes down and it has a place to rest. All right, now moving on, base anchors. They are different than cello anchors. Base anchors, if you're sitting at a pretty extreme angle and your base keeps slipping, you're gonna wanna get a base anchor. Now, the base anchors differ because it's shaped as a V instead of a circle for cellos. Now, these are just some of the really nice ones here. We have a base stand. So if I don't want to keep having my base on the ground, you would purchase a base stand and it would go upright this way. A real music stand. If a student is really starting to take off the music, I mean, a real music stand helps so much. Wire stands, they go over. For bass players, they're never tall enough. So I have all my students get a real music stand. The last one that's not on the list is earplugs. If you have students that are a little bit older and they're playing next to a drummer or doing musicals, it could be pretty loud in a student's ear. So just having a set, I have a nicer set right here, that having this little cheapies in your classroom is always a good idea. And this 
is what I have in my base case. Now let's talk about how to fold the base. Now, what I always tell my students is the base is basically your dance partner. It's big enough to be a dance partner. And while you're playing, you want to make sure that you're moving. So the first thing that you want to start off with is that you're standing up nice and straight. So you want to make sure that you're engaging your stomach muscles to help your back. And you want to make sure that your shoulders are relaxed and pulled back slightly. You don't want to be hunched over this way um, because eventually that will hurt your back in the long, long run. Now, how to get the base into this position. You're going to want to start with a triangle. So you're going to take both hands, you're going to extend them out. The base is going to be away from your body. Feet are shoulder width apart. And then you're going to rotate the base going towards your body. It's going to be clockwise until you can start to see the edge of the base. Now, this rib is going to rest in between your belly button and your hip bone. So again, I'm going to create my triangle. I'm going to put my feet shoulder width apart, bring the base out. The base is going to rotate just slightly so I can just start to see this start to line up with the spot that I'm looking for in between the belly button and the hip bone, and you're gonna lean the base into the body. What you don't want is for your belly button to be touching the side of the base. The other thing you wanna avoid is standing behind the base. You see when I get too far behind the base, the base slides. If I get too far in front of the base, the base goes either back or forwards. So here, you can just barely see the edge of the base. And this rib is resting right before I hit that hip button. So belly button, and then it's gonna rest right in that little nook. Now when we talk about the left hand, the thumb goes on the back of the base. What we want to avoid is the elbow resting against. When I rest my elbow against the back of the base, you see what happens to my first finger. It immediately, you know, loses all of its strength. It collapses. Also my wrist. Wrist is collapsed. So thumb on the back, elbow comes up. Now to create this right here, we're going to start with the wolf. So here's this little ears and we have this little nose. And when we pull the ears down, it's going to create nice rounded fingers. So I'm going to have my wolf, my wolf's coming around and creates my hand posture. What's very important is when you're playing bass that all your fingers are engaged and you also notice that I'm trying to keep these fingers hovering above to give these fingers strength, right? Now, you're going to notice that I'm moving my base. Traditionally, what we're looking for is the base to be around your eye level. We don't want it up above or else you're going to lose all the circulation in your arm, right? We don't want it too low or else you're going to end up with back posture. So just about eye level and the way I'm controlling this part is with my hip. I'm going back, I'm going up. So if I take the weight base away, I'm going back and I'm going up. I call it like the little bird that dips down to the water, right? So I'm going down and up. So if I'm gonna go for my E string and I want a little more power, I bring the bass to me for that low G, right? Now, some things that go wrong with this left hand 
is the first one. I've come up with funny names for it. It's called the slug. This is what I call the slug. This one, the thumb is going straight up towards the ceiling. And what happens there, as you notice my fingers, they go kind of like this and they're pointing down, right? My good posture, I'm creating a little checkerboard, right? If I flatten out my fingers, but the slug, my fingers start to point towards the floor. My thumb is up this way. And as I try and shift, it just kind of slides down, right? Like a slug. And also what happens is this collapses and ends up touching the side. With my perfect posture, I go up and that's not gonna be touching. The next one is the peekaboo thumb. This is when the thumb is waving high on the other side of the neck, right? Some kids do this because they want that extra power, right? So the way to fix that, sometimes what happens is when this is poking through, that means the base has gone very straight up and down, right? So to fix that, you'd either have to compensate, wrap around. The easy way to fix it with a student is you tell them to take a step back and it goes back to normal, good posture, right? So if I go forward, pick a boot thumb, right? I go back, go backwards. and it goes back into place. The next one is the claw. That's when all the fingers are really close together like this, and they're, they're kind of shifting around, and this is because they don't have the power. The reason why we do this wolf shape is that the thumb should be underneath this middle and ring finger, right? So as you see it when I'm doing a fourth finger, thumb, dance partner, right, moving around the base, is underneath these fingers, right? If I need a little bit more on my first finger, sometimes I'll sneak my thumb a little farther back, right? But traditionally, my thumb is pretty much here. Last but not least is broken fingers. That's when the fingers basically bend in. Right? What this does is it creates extra pressure on these joints right here, which can cause harm and it's also just bad posture. So what you want is all the joints to be nice and rounded. So where I'm actually playing the bass is on the fatty part of the tips of my fingers. Right, I'm not down in these pads down here. I'm up towards the top. So if I make a little indent again, I'm towards the top of my fingers, right? So again, very quickly to walk through this, how do you get your base into place? We're going to create the triangle. Stand up straight. Feet are shoulder width apart, spread your arms, rotate the base until you can start to see the edge. Bring the base in between the belly button and the hip bone, right? So down. Make the wolf. Bring the wolf around. So we're looking for a nice round shape, right? Bring the wolf around and set down your hand. So you want your wrist be somewhat flat, right? We don't want our wrist start going like this or down like this. And we want the elbow to be relaxed, but not resting on the back of the base. And that is this portion. Next is our right hand. Okay, let's talk about the right hand. Bases have two different kinds of bows. We have the German bow, often called the butler, which is this one right here. The other one is the French bow, gently go around, which is coined the Bottasini method. The French bow 
looks very similar to what the violin, viola, and cello use. The German bow was what everyone used for a very long time. And in recent years, the French bow has become more popular. For the German bow, how to hold it, you're gonna kinda make a gun shape. And then your two middle fingers are gonna go into it. Your index finger is gonna rest on top. The German bow rests at the fattier part of your hand. So it's gonna come down, it's gonna rest. Now the third finger is gonna rest right here, right? Index finger is gonna go right on top. Thumb is gonna come around and pinky rests down below. Now as I come down, the bow rests in my hand and I counteract the weight up top with these two fingers. When I draw the bow, it's going to look like this. So you want to keep the flexibility. So that is the German bow. Moving on to the French bow. have students do I'm a French bow player so what I do is I have students make the sign language E right we don't want E we want E that's nice and rounded right and you're gonna dump it over shake it out and you're gonna bring the bow up to it so what happens is your thumb rests along here right so sign language E you dump it over let the fingers kind of relax right and you're gonna bring the bow up and you're gonna bring the bow down so the bow is resting into the fingers and the thumb is pointing this way. So what it looks like as I'm playing is like this. So my right wrist is nice and flat. I'm also keeping the flexibility in my fingers. is the wrist to collapse because then my, my fingers collapse as well right you don't want a straight thumb straight thumb is like this where the thumb this is pointing down because my fingers will straighten out as well or my fingers will go like this so the thumb is bent that you want and the bowing motion is like you're walking right really it starts from here you're moving your elbow as well and you're moving this way so I have that's my elbow that's my shoulder as well so what happens is if I pull towards my body I get that chainsaw bow right you notice that it's really not even picking up so it needs to be nice and straight to get a good tone so if I'm pulling towards my body that's what you're gonna get I call it the little chicken arm right so when you're doing this walking motion posture for your right hand down we're ready to make some sound let's start with how do you rosin the bow now since our rosin is sticky you want to move in one direction down is usually the best and you really don't need very much so your posture 
fingers down bent, fingers relaxed, and you're gonna place the bow on string. One neat technique is to see if you can make a plucking sound. What I'm doing is I'm raising my fingers up. That exercise that we talked about, because I need that beginning engagement of the string to make the sound. Can you hear how I bit the string a little bit, right? So I'm going to bite the string and start the note. If we don't do that, we usually get scale, right? So you're going to engage it. down in the squeaker zone, as I like to call it, right? It's in a very happy place down here. Now, once I start to add the fingers, if my finger isn't completely engaged, you get that buzzing sound, right? If I fully engage the string, the note clears up. right because the pinky is the weakest one we're not gonna leave the pinky by itself you know let's get all the fingers down to get a nice clear tone all right now it's time to play some notes here's an excerpt that uses the bow tuned in fourths, E, A, D, and G. So since we are tuned in fourths, we do a little more shifting than the other string instruments. Right here, we have the two different schools of thought. When you look into certain books, you might run into positions that are based off of Samandal, or you might run into positions that are based off of Rabat. Here in Bakersfield, we use more of the Samandal method. The Samandal method is built on the natural minor scale. So I'm going to start on open G. And you can see here, I've included tapes on my bass, so you can see this a little easier. Uh, I didn't go all the way up to seventh position. Um, so here I have open G. A is first position. flat is second position. So when I'm shifting positions, I'm going to move my first finger. So I tap to see where I'm going. I replace. Third position is C. So I'm going to tap to see where I'm going. D is fourth position. So C is third. D is fourth. E flat is fifth. Okay. <laughs> F natural, <laughs> blonde moment. F natural is going to be sixth position. G 
she is going to be the seventh. So in between all of these positions, there are half positions. So it's mantle gets a little crazy when it comes to this. So if I'm counting, I have open G, half position, first position, second position, second and a half, third, third and a half, fourth, fifth, fifth and a half, There's a wonderful book by George Vance for solos that work very well for beginning students, junior high level students, and his method is built off of pivots. So when you look into this book and you're wondering why it's not matching with the Samandel method, it's because it's built off of this robot method. So, so I don't confuse you, we're going to stick with the Samandel method for today. Um, Alright, so we have our posture. Triangle, we have base in, base is perfectly balanced, we have the wolf, we've done the sign language E, we dump it over, make sure the bow is nice and relaxed in the hand. Now, let's start our lesson. We want to play notes, but first thing we have to do is start with long tones. For bass players, long tones never go away. It's how we practice good tone, it's how we warm up our body to begin playing. Well, first one is rock the boat. That's where I'm going back and forth between each string. Again, leapfrog. I'm rolling the bow as I skip the string, right? I'm skipping over the A string to get to my D string, right? So let's review our strings one more time. E is for elephant, right? Our lowest string. it's opposite of a violin, right? E is the highest for them, E is our lowest. Now, let's talk about scales. Again, for a bass player, we like scales, and if we don't like scales, we learn to love them. G major scale, we start in first position with two on our E string. Or really engaging that string, right? I'm kind of moving that E string towards my body so I have a little more power. See when my G is perfectly in tune? See how this is resonating? Open A. One is B. Two is C. Open D. One is E. Four is F sharp. Exercises, exercises in thirds. You can go into fourths. You could really do a lot when you're practicing with a scale. What's nice about the G major scale is that I don't have to shift. So this is the first scale that I start off with. I'm going to notate 
rotate that. I would go like this. So for shifts, I add a dash. We'll see that later on. Since there is no shifts, there is no dashes. So it's two, open, one, two, open, one, four, open. And I have my students memorize that finger pattern. So that is for G. Now something that you could play in G major without shifting is over the rainbow. start off in first position. All positions are written in Roman numerals. And our shift is to second position. Right? So if we go back, G major is all in first position. So what our C major scale is going to look like, two on our A string. originally underneath B flat, if we remember correctly, right? So our positions are followed by our first finger. Now, what we have is we're replacing our four with two, right? So, and our one replaces the two. So what I have students do is they tap their four and they replace their four with two. So the one falls into that second position mark, right? Be natural. Mm -hmm. position. Now if I wanted to, I can make the same pattern here over to G. So how G major would change from here would be why I like the number system. So you can see how they exactly match now. So I'll play C major first very quickly. D major. Open one four. Open one four. Dash two four. With that pattern, I can play A major, and I can also play E major. I like. 
like doing this because a lot of times we think about just learning how to shift on one string and then learning how to cross over becomes difficult. So if you start this technique very early on, you start to pick up how to shift on these lower strings. So if I play D major, right so this is first this is second this is second and a half third so now we're entering into this teal tape this is C this is C sharp I don't want to slow down or have the slug thumb, right? What I also don't want is the jump. So you just glide on top of the string. So that's D major. I'll play it one more time. Let's change it up. We've talked about first position, second position, third position, but we haven't talked about half position yet. As bass players, we don't really want to be shifting around too much. So if we have to go back below first position, we're going to stay there as long as we can. The two scales that we have is F major and B flat. Again, they use the same pattern. F major, one, right? E to F natural, or is G, open A, one is B flat, or is C, open D, two is E, four is F, two is E, open D, four is C, That's not necessarily because it's a video. I have my students do this as well. It helps you connect with what note you're actually playing. And as you start to shift around, it will also help you as well. So as you're shifting, you would say one is third position C. So we've talked about the bow. <clears throat> Let's go into pizzicato. We have two different kinds of pizzicato. One is more classical. For children, they would have their thumb down, and I'm plucking with the fattier part of my finger, not down in here, but again, where we play the notes on our left hand, I'm not going underneath it because I can snap, right? We 
classical, you can get different kinds of articulations. That one's more round. That one's a little more articulated, right? And if I have quarter notes, I'll want to stop them with my hand. If I wanted it to ring, you would get a note. marked like this. Now for our jazz pits, my finger is going to be downward and you usually use two fingers. So the first one is for every note. The third one is for skips. enjoyed learning about bass and the wonderful world of it and I hope you have fun learning the instrument. Here's a little piece of music for